I'm really enjoying this. Uh, I like telling the stories and I like doing this whole process, the research and photos and everything. And uh, I realize when I look at the episodes that um, I don't need to do it previously each time. And, and this one, we're gonna do what uh, in network television is called a saga cell. And a saga cell is a way of bringing the audience up to date. And usually you do it for the first couple episodes about the theme of the of the series and, and um, where it's coming from as opposed to plot points and our saga cell begins here because there's the key to what I'm doing comes out of this Thomas Wolfe book of Time in the River which I read in 1972 and it moved me very much and it's one chapter that has stuck in my head since then and and the character of Thomas Wolfe goes uh, to college in Harvard he comes from a very small uh, town in North Carolina and he meets his professor in the professor's office and it's this book line study where it seems like all the knowledge of the world is in it and um, Thomas Wolfe's very impressed as this man is talking to him and, and, uh, about what he's going to learn and he keeps opening these books and showing him these passages and each passage is, each passage is marked with a bookmark and he realizes that this man knows this material so well that he synthesized it down to these little sections and as he looks past him to all the stuff behind him get it uh there are bookmarks all around the room and that they are like a stairway of knowledge that you could or a ladder you could pull yourself up the bookmarks and learn everything that this man has and it's a way to tell a story and and that inspired me and I finally get a chance to tell a story that way um, because that's what I'm trying to do by using the uh, uh, the books of my life and uh, and the movies and the music and, and the fr photos of the friends and so forth I'll uh, take you of the ladder to the story of my life so uh, let's jump to something that all of us go through um, We've all had adolescence. We all go through that, that storm of emotions and that uh, tremendous feelings of insecurity. And all that stuff is heightened and brought to a head to the most unforgettable time in our lives. I'm talking about high school. Rah, rah, rah. High school, sis, boom, bah. Here we are, Fort Lee High School, built in the late 40s. So looks ex this is exactly what it looks like. Um, and uh, our team was called the Bridgman because right behind the high school was, was the George Washington Bridge and our colors were black and orange. Um, before I go any further, I think it's important that I um, explain my, uh, my relationship to the truth. I am not a reliable narrator. Uh, you know that term if you studied English lit. I am, um, this isn't, Nonfiction, what I'm doing here, and it isn't fiction. It's let's just call it semi-fiction. Now I've told these stories a lot to my family, to my friends, and to my wife. And Joanne busts me and says, "You know, you didn't tell it that way last time." And uh, you know, it's changed. And when I talk to people who were there, it's different. I, it's the way I remember it, the way I'd like it to have been. And if uh, I need to get it to be a better story, I will manipulate the events for that. And if I, there's a laugh, I'm gonna chase it. And uh, like uh, John Ford says in The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, um, if the facts don't fit the legend, print the legend. So for all of you who went to high school with me, you'll just have to bear with the fact that I'm exaggerating and changing things and trying to find the truth in fiction. And, and I'm a big believer in trying to find the truth in art as opposed to necessarily finding the truth in facts. Um, here I am when I graduated from Fort Lee High School. Huh? Don't even look close to being the same. Okay, now it's time to meet the students of Fort Lee High School. So um, let's cue the music. And here it is, the music of the four seasons. Walk like a man for the boys and ragdoll for the girls. Hear it playing? Because here they are, the Jersey Boys from Fort Lee High School, the class of 1966. There we are, at an assembly, okay? These, uh, as I, when I showed Joanne this picture, she said to me, so let me get this straight. You went to high school with the, the cast of The Sopranos. And I laughed because 
It does look like that everyone's wearing a little tie and a shirt and everything. Now, Fort Lee High School had a bunch of problems at the time. They, um, they weren't going to get accredited. They, had, uh, they were stuck in the educating system of the, of the 40s and the 50s. And um, basically, you give the kids a, a lecture and a book, and they have to spit that back at you. And, and they weren't going to get accredited, and, which meant that if you went there, you couldn't go to college. And they had huge disciplinary problems. And, and when I got there, they decided to have three school disciplinarians. That's how, that's how rough these guys were, you know? Um, so... They made sure everyone wore ties because that was going to make a difference. And girls, you had to wear long skirts, no culottes, no pants for girls, and no jeans on everybody. And just to show you what I looked like at that particular assembly, that's me. All right? I mean, those guys could snap me in half. Now, here's what I faced at Fort Lee High School. Uh, you know, I was a big reader, and I, and I wanted to read the books in the Fort Lee High School you know, library, and, and I was kind of a B student. I couldn't spit the stuff back exactly as it was, and I also tended to dream out the window, you know? I got this thing where, you know, he could be a, so much of a better student if he only applied himself, but I was more interested in other things. Like, for instance, I read in the New York Times this list of the best books of the, since World War II, and I uh, Look at this list. It's got Catcher in the Rye, Naked and the Dead, uh, The Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison, Go Tell It on the Mountain, Herzog uh, by Saul Bellow. You know, I'm sure there's a John Updike book, so I immediately bring this list to the library and to see what books they have there, and they don't have any of them, none of them. And the librarian looks at me like, why are you taking, want these books? Because every single one of these books is banned in our library. These are not fit for someone of your age. So... That kind of sums up the problem of me in high school. I was not fit to be someone of my age, okay? So just to go back to how rough this school was. Now, um, these guys loved trouble, you know? Nothing made them happier than pulling some kind of big stunt, you know, and getting caught and then getting two weeks of detention because detention was where they lived. Now, they also liked to fight, and we had a lot of fights at games. Um, not at halftime, that would interrupt the game, but afterwards, as both a set of fans would be leaving, they would come up from behind and jump the fans of the other school, and fists would fly, and they did this a lot on, also on weekends, used to go to these uh, CYO dances, a Catholic youth organization. Now, they would all wear these um, black shoes with taps or cleats under them and so when they walked they made a clicking sound it made them sound tougher than they were think west side story and uh at these dances they get in fights and come in monday and show off their knuckles being scraped or their or bruises and one of them uh, anthony del vecchio i think he's in this yeah here's anthony anthony del vecchio came in on a monday morning with a bruise shaped just like a horseshoe he had been in a fight with a guy with horseshoe cleats, and the guy had kicked him right in the face. Now, Anthony had his own horseshoe cleats, and when I said, does that hurt? He says, you should see the other guy, and he meant it. The other guy, I think, suffered from that. Now, you, of course, never went into the men's room at uh, Fort Lee High School because it was a smoke-filled obstacle course, you know, where uh, cherry bombs went off, and, and kids would steal pinballs from machines and throw them against the wall, and they'd zing all around. Now, Another legend, just to give you an idea of what our students were like, think of someone like uh, guys in that row, the Sopranos, and uh, there was a sense of pride in Fort Lee High School about how long it would take to have a class get rid of the substitute teacher. It would drive the substitute teacher out of the room with bad behavior, loud, you know, jokes, et cetera, et cetera. And um, this was going on in a plain geometry class one day, and this substitute teacher was having a real tough time with one of these guys, and she got too close to him and got in his face a little bit with a little too much anger, and he took the clip on his notebook, reached out, and clipped it on her nose, right? And she's standing there with this clip on her nose, blood dripping down, and he, of course, walks to the window, opens the window, and jumps out the window and cuts school. Okay. That's what it was like at Fort Lee High School. Now, I say this stuff, and I say this stuff, okay, with love and respect, because here they are today. This is the class of 66. Here they are then. 
and here they are today at the last high school reunion, okay? I know them all, and <laughs> I like them all, and I still stay in touch. So, you know, I'm saying all this stuff, but um, on the other hand, uh, this guy lives within me. Okay. The fears, uh, the sense of insecurity, the things that I remember about high school, the most fearsome, because let's go right, you know, here's the good news, here's the bad news, let's go to the the worst news of all, and, and it's a, a three-letter word, all right? Can you guess what it is? Jim, okay. Jim at Fort Lee High School. I, I don't know how to describe it other than to show you our gym teacher, Mr. Spence. Now, Mr. Lloyd Spence was the head of the department and the director of athletics, okay? Doesn't he look athletic to you, you know? And um, he had the, he ran the gym class the way that Otto Preminger ran the prison of war camp in Stalag 17. That was Mr. Mr. Pence, Spence. And um, his idea of like a big gym activity uh, uh, for himself, you know, keeping in shape would be to uh, smoke an unfiltered camel while we were doing athletics. That was kind of what he did. About 10 minutes into every class, he would say, oh, you guys are doing great. And he'd light that camel up and disappear into his office while, um, for instance, uh, cross country, which was a big thing in the fall, we would run twice around the track, you know, and as just as we were heading out into the park, Mr. Spence would go off and smoke his camel and the Sopranos would uh, run really hard for their first two laps and stay near the front. And as soon as they got out of Mr. Spence's uh, sight, they'd go to their favorite hiding place behind some trees and they'd have a smoke till the rest of the class had run the course. And as the class came around for the end, they'd run out from behind the trees and race them all to the finish line and not even breaking a sweat, finishing the top 10. That was kind of the way things worked. Now, for instance, um, any sport which involved equipment of any kind, whether it be softball or whatever it was, as soon as Mr. Spence left, that equipment would become weaponized. All right, get the picture because I'm going to tell you something, a sport that Mr. Spence thought was a really good idea for us. And, and when I say it, it's, now that you know the character of, of these guys and the school and the atmosphere, the name of the sport that he gave us, you ready? Archery. That's right. He gave those guys bows and arrows. Now, believe it or not, I was really good at archery. I, I learned archery because it was a major sport at Jewish summer camp, you know. At Zionist youth camp, archery was a big deal. Uh, more about that later. And so, you know, I got pretty good at it. And the whole thing was Mr. Spence would set up, say, eight targets and divide this, the class up. And of course, those guys, the Sopranos, would be together at one, one target. And um, eight bows, you know, and maybe 50, 60 arrows. And firing away at the target, and as soon as Mr. Spence would go to have his unfiltered camel, the Sopranos would confiscate all the bows and turn on the rest of the class, and the whole thing would turn into um, uh, the Hunger Games, okay? <laughs> we would be hunted down, and they would happen to be terrible shots, you know, but you know, the school, the class would scatter as they fired bows and arrows, and, you know, they'd cheat, of course, and mark their cards as all bullseyes. But that's nothing, nothing compared to the sport that Mr. Spence invented. And I think its basis is in those obstacle courses that you see that Marines take. And uh, here's a picture of our gym. Now, this was taken recently. Uh, we don't, they didn't have the air conditioning then. It was, it's a small room with a, as you can see, the basketball court, there's no out of bounds. When you go out of bounds or you're fouled and pushed out of bounds, you smack into the wall. Okay, there's a, a metaphor there for you. Um, now, up there is the bleachers, and that's where, like, the, the fans of the home team, the the Bridgman fans would, would be, and the cheerleaders were on the side, and on the opposite side would be the, the, um, the visitors and, and their fans. Uh, and for this particular sport, this wall would be covered in, in uh, tumbling mats, and this sport is called Climb the Wall. Okay, so what was Climb the Wall? 
Climb the wall was you'd run, and the thing was you'd run, you'd scamper up the wall, grab the railing, and flip yourself over. Now, if you did it really easily, uh, say you were a, um, a pole vaulter or a broad jumper or maybe one of the guards on the basketball team or someone coordinated, you would gauge your steps, run, get a little purchase with the toe of your, your sneakers and use that to leverage yourself up, grab the top railing and climb right over in one movement, triple A. That's how he used to grade. He'd give you double A, triple A's, you know, down to F. So that was how they did it. Now, the rest of the class, like for instance, those guys, had a, a different task because they didn't have the skill to do that. So when they would run and they get their steps off, they would hit that wall and grab anything and using strength and determination, pull themselves over and they'd get like a C or a B. And then there was the lame, the nerds, the um, uncoordinated me, okay? And so you'd run, and you'd run at the wall, trying to gauge your distance, and of course you'd lose track of it, and you'd jump, and I would never get my, I'd hit that wall, smack, like Wile E. Coyote, you know, in a Roadrunner cartoon. You know when the mountain has a, uh, has a tunnel painted on it, Wile E. Coyote, Coyote doesn't know he can't get in the, wham, right? And then you just kinda, just slip down to the floor, and, pretend you were dead or hope you went unconscious because that was just the beginning. That was not the worst. The fact you were getting an F and were already humiliated, that was nothing because everyone who got an F was ushered into the center of the gym for part two. And that was a sport that Mr. Spence loved. It was called bombardment. Okay, so imagine all the losers are in the center of the gym in the circle, and surrounding them are everyone else, right? And then he would hand out these balls, all different size rubber balls, and I'm talking about 10, 12 of these things, and have the people on the outside throw the balls at you as hard as they could. Now, this is about as much of a sport as like uh, in Afghanistan, stoning an, uh, an adulterer, you know, with rocks. And these balls were coming at you really fast. If you got hit with the ball, you were out. If you caught the ball, the person who threw it was out. Now, um, the only way you could get a better mark was if you were the last person in the center, you know, and then you got a C. Everyone else kept their ref. And here's the thing, everyone, the quarterback or the pitcher, they're all love to throw, not the big ones, the little ones. They're about the size of a large grapefruit or, or you know, a melon. And they throw it and they you know, be about only eight or 10 feet away and it would hitch in the head and bounce up really high and everyone would cheer. <laughs> and Mr. Spence loved that, okay? So the lessons of Mr. Spence's class stayed with me all these years. Um, the survival of the fittest, the cruelty for those who are not as good at certain activities as others. Um, that left a big impression on me. And most of all, I wanted to get revenge for all that humiliation for myself and for everyone else who, have, who were humiliated because, you know, by the way, bombardment was the end result of every sport. You got that? If you were the, were the lowest on the softball team, Bombardment. If you were at the lowest in archery, bombardment, volleyball, flag football, bombardment was the answer. We feasted. They feasted on bombardment a couple of days a week. Okay, so this is like I graduated in 66. Let's jump forward 12 years, and I am making this movie called Rock and Roll High School. Okay? Now, um, I have a character who is the old principal, who's going to be replaced by... Mary Warren up by Miss Toger, and I need a character who is so old and senile and incontinent that they've got to replace him. And I named that character Mr. Spence, and he's sitting at the table during the meeting, and they've got a bowl of oatmeal in front of him, and they're feeding the oatmeal, and it's dribbling down his chin. And he is um, the head of the Department of Athletics and the school disciplinarian and the outgoing principal. 
And uh, I needed to cast someone for that part. So here's Grady Sutton. See what I'm getting at here? Grady Sutton was in a lot of W.C. Fields movies. He was a wonderful character actor. This was his last part. And surprisingly, he looked so much like Mr. Spence. And in the scene, after he gets his oatmeal and, and the meeting's called to adjournment, he falls over, splat, into his oatmeal. And his face is covered with oatmeal and a big close-up. Revenge. Or, as I like to think of it, bombardment to cinema. Okay. Now, when you think of the 60s, you think of only one thing. The times were a-changing. This is my first Bob Dylan record, you know, and I, I played it to death. I love this record. It, it served my sense of righteousness, okay? Um, songs like, of course, the times are a-changing and with God on our side and when the ship comes in and only a pawn in their game. And I, and I actually wrote the words out to the times that are changing and put it on my wall and locked my door often as night because I went through the terrible teens playing the music loud, you know what I mean? And, and when my mother, parents had company over, she would have the Mahjong girls over. Uh, they would, you know, have a nice piece of cake and a, and a Danish and a little coffee. And after the game was over, they'd walk around. My mother would show, this is my sister Claudia's room. Oh, it's so cute and everything. And they'd come to my room. And when I heard them coming, I'd turn up the music really loud. And they'd try to open the door and they'd hear me playing the song. And then they'd read the words on the sign that I put up outside. Uh, come mothers and fathers throughout the land. Don't criticize what you can't understand. Your sons and their daughters are beyond your command. Your old road is rapidly fading. I mean, I was anti-bourgeoisie, and they would read this one time, and they just started laughing. And they read, oh, the times are changing. Isn't that cute? And I'm sitting inside, and I'm just like, wow. I was burning it and mortified. So, so much for my uh, anti-bourgeois, across the generation gap, uh, drawing of the lines. And, but I was getting into folk music. Peter, Paul, and Mary, this is like the second album. Uh, a folk music I ever bought. By then I had Meet the Beatles and all that stuff. Now, at that time, Fort Lee was going through changes like everything else, and it was an influx of people. They built these high rises, and there was an influx of people from exotic lands, exotic places like the Bronx and Brooklyn and Queens, and they brought their culture with them. And uh, it started to fill up with other kinds of people. And in the summer between my sophomore and my junior year, we were playing basketball almost every day on this basketball court uh, next to the Catholic school. And um, this guy was out there with red hair and uh, we didn't know him and he's a new guy and he's shooting set shots, you know, and nailing them one after another like a three-pointer, bang, bang, bang. And so we went up to him and introduced ourselves and, and that's Dennis Benson, who is my closest friend right now. And uh, we have been friends for, I don't know, 55 years, 60, whatever it is. Dennis now lives in Florida, and he's retired and lives in St. Augustine. This is not what he looked like back then. And um, Dennis was a really good basketball player, I, and uh, he wasn't going to go to Fort Lee High School. He was going to a Catholic school in the city. And we told us the name of the school, and he said, I, we said, where do you go to school? And he said, Power Memorial. Power Memorial High School? Powell Memorial High School was the number one high school in the country for basketball. They had a team, the forwards could they had pictures of the forwards dunking over people, jumping over people, and their center. Their center was the dominant player in the country in the game. And that guy's name was Lou Alcindor. Dennis went to high school with Kareem Abdul Jabbar. Yeah. All respect to Dennis. And Dennis, I love Dennis. Dennis is a great guy. And Together, we bonded over so much material and so much. For example, Catcher in the Rye. We were both obsessed with this book. Dennis took it a little further. He started wearing a, a hunting cap like Holden Caulfield and a raincoat like Holden Caulfield. And he tore out the lining. It's going to be embarrassed. I'm telling you this. And used to write quotes from this book and from all the Salinger's books and then poetry all inside the lining. And that Dennis, in a nutshell, he's filled with culture. He's, he's very smart, and he loves poetry. He's the soul of a poet. And uh, he went to Rutgers and became the dean of students at Rutgers, and then the dean of the film school. He's, um, he likes serious art, and he likes, uh, um, you know, 
uh, serious movies, you know. A Fun Night for Dennis is a Bresson movie. And uh, it was Dennis, um, through his brother. See, Dennis had one thing that I didn't have. He had an older brother. And older brothers are a big advantage, our older sisters, because they give you the knowledge that you don't have while they're insulting you. And uh, Dennis introduced me to Joan Baez. Now, um, there isn't a, a, Dennis, you play for Dennis, um, a woman singer singing a sad, lonely song. He's going to buy the album. So Joan Baez was perfect. I know he, I think my three quarters of his records have songs like that. And Dennis, I'm only kidding. Anyway, Joan Baez, we both fell in love with Joan Baez because Joan Baez at the time was a legendary relationship with Bob Dylan. And, you know, Bob Dylan was the hero. There they are. The two of them together. And uh, this is my favorite Joan Baez record. Um, Farewell, Angelina. A lot of great Dylan songs on it. Um, this is still a really satisfying record. And she, her singing's beautiful. And uh, she's a great artist. Uh, so anyway, if you're going to buy us, buy this one. Um, now, here we are, Dennis and I, on the steps of Fort Lee High School. And um, Dennis, his brother introduced us to a record called Folk Song 65. And Folk Song 65 was a sampler of folk music that only cost a dollar. This is a very smart move by the head of Electra Records um, to do this. Um, Electra Records was an up and coming company. They'd been around for a while in the folk music scene and they would go on to sign The Doors and a lot of other bands and open up the way to what became, you know, 60s rock. Uh, and anyway, Jack Jack, uh, Jack Holstrom, whatever his name was, um, came up with this idea, and this cost a dollar, and an album, a stereo album, then cost $3.99. He usually bought the albums in mono. And so you got a sampler, and all these great artists like Judy Collins and Tom Rush, Tom Paxton, Colonel Van Glover, and a band that I learned to love, and I'll talk about it another time, the Paul Butterfield Blues Band. These guys were the real shit, okay? These were great. So... We got that, you know? Again, just to remind you, here's what Dennis and I look like today on the steps of Fort Lee High School. Look what kind of shape he's in. He's a terrific athlete. Um, when I grow up, I, I want to be Dennis. <laughs> um, and Dennis was also sophisticated and would take me into New York City and introduced me to the life in Greenwich Village. You know, I... Been there before, but now I was there on our own, and we would go around to the bookstores and the record stores, and most of all, we'd go to sit in Washington Square Park. And how we'd get there would be on a Sunday. We would, and I can't believe we did this, we would hitchhike across the George Washington Bridge and convince the driver to let us out in the Bronx. And then we'd get in the subway, and we'd both squeeze through the turnstile, you know, for one dime, both of us could get all the way down to the Greenwich Village and we'd walk around the, the, the park watching the folk music and looking at the hot girls, the ethnic girl looking girls, or ethnic clothes and ironed hair. That was our ideal, you know. And uh, this is another, if you want to get this record, um, this is uh, Washington Square Memoirs. It's really complete, has some wonderful music in it. Uh, that just brings me back to those days. Another thing that brings me back to those days was Inside Lewin Davis, the, the Cone Brothers movie, that's based on a very important singer from that time. His name is Dave Van Ronk. Dave Van Ronk was um, a big, they called him the uh, mayor of McDougal Street, I think it was, and uh, Bob Dylan stayed in this house, and he was the first person to record, to do a cover version of a Joni Mitchell song. He basically went to see everyone who came into the village, and. This is a wonderful record, and his cover songs are wonderful. He's a really good guitar player, an important presence. Now, if we were looking for girls like this, it, it was, because of the influx of people into Fort Lee, sometimes, uh, in one case, a really interesting young woman moved to Fort Lee, and for the sake of this story, I'm going to call her Jane, okay? Jane... Um, wore the Fred Braun sandals and had the ironed hair and the ethnic clothes, and she sat across from me in study hall. And uh, she hated Fort Lee High School. She really thought we were hicks. You know, she came from Queens. And um, 
she also was always talking about her friends who went to college and all this stuff. But she would talk to me because I seemed to be have some sense of the world. And she'd look at the books I was reading. We'd talk about music. And a very big decision was I made about Jane. I, I asked Jane out on the first date I ever went out on. I know. I was like, I should have read the cards better because she was always talking about this guy, Wallace, who was a, a college student, you know, at Boston University. So um, the plan was this. I would um, go to her apartment on, a fr on that Friday night and pick her up, and we'd go to the Leaf Theater to watch the new Pink Panther movie. That sounds like a good plan, doesn't it? Well, this is a good first date. So I'd get there, and... And Jane is on the phone. Give me a minute, give me a minute, I got right? She's, and so, you know, I'm waiting, and five or ten minutes go by, and I go, Jane, we're going to miss the pink bench. She goes, I got a problem. You know, Wallace, I told you about Wallace. Wallace is freaking out. I had no idea what freaking out was. I said, Wallace is freaking out. It sounded serious. And she says, I got to talk to Wallace. And she took the phone. Just wait for me. I got to talk to Wallace. And she goes into the bathroom. She had a long cord and a princess phone and closes the door. And she's talking to Wallace in the bathroom. And I'm, you know, hanging out in her room as looking around at her books, uh, looking through her records, you know, playing a couple records. Uh, soon uh, 20 minutes goes by, 30 minutes. And after 40 minutes, I realize that this first date, it's not going anywhere, okay? Time for me to go home, but I came up with a plan. So I go to the bathroom, and I knock on the door. You know, Jane answers the door, hello? And I, you know, I said, and she says, I'm so sorry. I said, Jane, I realize Wallace is freaking out. Actually, I'm doing it a lot better than I said at the time. And, uh, now I'm sounding controlled. Um, Wallace is freaking out, and I understand this. Tell you what, Jane. Um, why don't you uh, finish the call, and I'll see you in school on Monday. Uh, and she goes, oh, that's great. I said, you know what, Jane? Can I borrow something from you? I'll return it on Monday. Can I borrow this record? And she goes, oh, it's a good record. And I said, I, I know. I don't have it. I got to listen to it. So I leave. I didn't return it on Monday. So, Jane, if you're looking for this record, I've got it right here. And a little song for you, Jane, because of my first date. It's on this record. It's called, It Ain't Me, Babe. It Ain't Me You're Looking For, Babe. No, no, no. It Ain't Me, Babe. It Ain't Me You're Looking For. And also, um, my back pages. I was so much older then. I'm younger than that now. So thank you, Jane. All right. Now, something else was in the air at those times, and that was protest music. This is Phil Oaks, and this is an album, an uh, anti-war record called uh, I Ain't Marching Anymore. Uh, and he was, seemed to be against war and all that, and it left an impression on me. And I started to feel the, the winds of change in the political scene in, in Vietnam and, and the civil rights movement. And I'm reading the New York Times on a Sunday, and there's a giant ad against the war in Vietnam. And what catches my eye about the ad is the names on the ad, because at the very top of the ad, in big letters, announcing that we should get out of Vietnam, which really struck me. I was 16, 17, I never thought about that, of literally trying to convince our government to go a different way, you know, were these two. Yeah. Bob and Joni were at the very top. Peter, Paul, and Mary were on the ad. All these people whose albums I had were uh, for us leaving Vietnam, and I kind of had always thought that we should be in Vietnam because I hadn't really thought about it. And, uh, and it kind of rocked my world. And, and when I come across something that changes my view on the world, I tend to take a step back and think about it. And I did. And just at that time, as I was thinking about all that, um, I had a world history teacher named Mr. Kelly. Now, Mr. Kelly um, was American history, world history, and the basketball coach, and uh, an ex-Marine. There's a, the eyes of Mr. Kelly. Mr. Kelly was a killer, and Mr. Kelly was for the war in Vietnam, and he really drove the basketball team hard. He was a great coach, you know. We always were, you know, we won the league championship, and we'd go on to the state championship. We'd, 
we do really well for a small town, you know. And no nonsense with Mr. Kelly. But Mr. Kelly was unhappy with all this talk and all these protests and kids burning their draft cards and wanted to have a debate in class about why we should be in Vietnam and whether we should be in Vietnam or not. And that seemed like a great idea to him. And, you know, so who wants to be uh, on the side that's uh, uh, for the war in Vietnam? Boom. Hands shut up. Now, in Fort Lee High School, there was a type of student that I used to, we used to call goody-goodies, that they would take whatever was in the textbook and uh, whatever notes from the lectures, and they'd spit it back to the teachers. Now, they'd get great grades, but I never saw the goody-goodies in the library reading the top, any of the top 10 books from, uh, since World War II. So uh, as I looked around, as they were on the team, and then you know some of the basketball players being no fools. I'm, I'm with you, coach, you know. I want to make a bit starting group. All right, who's going to be against the war? Nothing. Crickets. And I think to myself, well, maybe this might be a time to, you know, stick my hand up in the air, you know. Oh, Arkish figures. All right. So uh, he then assigns like three cheerleaders to my, to my team. You know, very nice girls, but uh, not that up on current events or the political situation in Southeast Asia. So uh, I did what I go to the school library, nothing, you know, uh, nothing worth, you know, what I needed. So I go to Greenwich Village and I'm, I'm in the village and I, I start buying books at the A Street bookstore. I remember that one and Sheridan Square bookstore and, you know, more information than I could need against the war. You know, you go up to someone in that part of us and say, got anything about why we shouldn't be in Southeast Asia? Boom, you know, village voice. I had never read anything this radical. I mean, the realist is another one I got. I mean, I can't even tell you what's in the realist is so obscene. So I'm reading all this stuff, you know, and uh, I still read the village voice today. So that started me on that path. And now I'm prepped. If you know me, I'm the king of prep, you know. Anyone who works with me knows I got a notebook full of notes. I'm ready to go. The day of the debate, Mr. Kelly sets us loose. The pro team starts talking, and I realize that they have read maybe one newspaper article, and they're just talking about patriotism, and how America is the land of liberty and uh, freedom, and so should Vietnam being it, and they have no idea of the context. And I start giving a speech how... Vietnam is a country where many countries have tried to take them over, and it is part of their culture to resist it. And um, it's their country. We should let them live the lives and have the government that they want. All right. So now it's like the time where pro and con, and, and whatever they say, which is, you know, five seconds, ten seconds, I'm nailing them with the facts and, you know, uh, the CIA appointed a government, you know, and the CIA infiltrated the Viet Cong and, and killed off the leaders and, uh, and napalm is burning the skin off the peasants. And Mr. Kelly is getting kind of pissed with me, you know. And now when it's the summation, he steps in and takes over the debate and he's throwing things at me about the domino theory and communism and, and you don't believe in, com you know. Um, I made an enemy that day, Mr. Kelly, you know, because at the end of the debate, as I'm walking out of the classroom, I look over my shoulder, and Mr. Kelly is looking at me with the eyes of a sniper because now um, I've been branded a troublemaker with a smart mouth. And that became my identity in the high school from then on. And as Bob Dylan would say, the lines they were drawn the curse it was cast. The present now will later be past because the times they are changing. And that was the beginning of me across the generation gap and on the wrong side of so many more issues at Fort Lee High School. But the good news is I had reinforcements. We had new people. We had a bunch of new people that were really smart and joined us in our um, trip to the culture wars. And there they are. Um, now, this person right here is Susan Miller. And Susan and I were like soulmates, you know. We thought alike, and she was smart and knew so much culturally, and we spent so much time together. And that's Leslie Maitland. And le we're all still friends, and Leslie ended up writing for the New York Times and going to the University of Chicago. And Susan went to Bennington. And we all know what 
Bennies and girls were like. Anyway, so that was Susan. And, uh, and, and then, of course, Dylan helped us. He put out this record, you know, bringing it all back home. And just to show you what's coming next, August 28th, 1965, Forest Hills Tennis Stadium. Dylan, he goes electric. Here he is with Robbie Robertson playing electric music. And guess who's on the front lines? Susan, Dennis, and Leslie. So, see you next time, right? Because the times, they are a-changing.